We are in a series entitled Just James where we've stripped everything away and gone straight to the Bible to study this challenging book. Written by the baby brother of Jesus to Jewish followers who had forsaken everything to follow Jesus. They were not casual Christians. And let me just stop and say, I believe that the days of casual Christianity are over in America. I, I believe that with all this within me. The battle lines are being drawn too much. The good is separating from evil, light from darkness. So it's not time to play. It's time to dig in. Amen. It's time to be who we really are. And, and he's telling them, since you're going through this, I want you to walk through every trial and every temptation, finding your joy and fulfillment in Jesus. And don't ever give in and don't ever give up. In the first part of chapter 2, he teaches us not to show preferential treatment to anybody for any reason, but to follow the, love, the law of love with all people. And now he gets to the good part, if you're a preacher, that is. He gets to genuine faith and good works. For him, it is as simple as the root and the fruit. If you've got the root of faith... It will produce the fruit of good works in your life. He's sort of drawing a dichotomy. Let's look at it for a moment. Works without faith is religion. And I'm not talking about pure religion that comes from God. I'm talking about man's religion. I'm talking about good morality, helping your neighbors, serving your community. But you don't have the divine motivation of the inspiration of your faith. It's not born out of relationship with God. It's not really doing good. It's trying to be good by doing good. That's religion. Here's the dichotomy. Are you ready? Faith without works is rebellion. It is saying you believe one way, but you live another way. It is living truly in disobedience to what you say you believe. Now, how many of you, when you have a son or daughter and they are disobeying you, you say they are being? And some of you, like, they are being prepared to leave this world in just a few moments. <laughs> Rebellion. It is doing the opposite of what you say you believe. So he says, a lot of people can be religious and do good things with no real motivation of faith. Or a lot of people can be rebellious and say they believe, but yet not do what they believe. And it opens up the battle among the theologians of faith versus works. Let's read together just a moment. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith and don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? In other words... If there's no external evidence, is there any eternal value? You following that? We can't see it. So we go to faith versus works. He's talking about faith and works. Now immediately, you would think he's being combative. But watch what he says. Now someone may argue. I told you there's the, there's the theological battle, the theological discussion between faith and works. Someone may argue some people have faith and others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? In other words, I can't see what's on the inside of you unless you show me on the outside of you. Now, I love his response. What good is, how, how can you show me without your deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. In other words, I'll show you what I believe by how I behave. That's a great place to say amen. I will demonstrate in front of you what God has done on the inside of me. Now, at first glance, it seems like James is in a battle with the heathen church persecutor Saul who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. God gloriously changed his life. He became the Apostle Paul and his writings make up more of the New Testament than any other person's single writings themselves. So he wrote most of the New Testament. And Paul says, salvation is by grace through faith. Okay? It's simple for him. It was a truth then, and by the way, this is true now. 
(laughs) Are you grateful for the grace of God in your life? You're not saved because you were good enough. You're saved by the grace of God through faith. Watch, let's just read it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Watch this. Not by works so that no one can boast. It is absolutely true that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. We are, we are saved solely by the grace of God, and we receive that grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the word faith there is the, word, the Greek word pistis, which simply means God's divine persuasion. We're not talking about man's mental ascent in the, in the existence of God. We are talking about the gift of faith deposited by the Holy Spirit in our life. See, God knows that we are so helpless and he is so loving that even the faith comes from him. I have nothing to offer in my salvation experience. It comes solely by God who loves me so much that he sends his Holy Spirit to persuade me of that love through Jesus Christ. It is the divine persuasion. So, James isn't arguing with this at all. Not by any stretch of the imagination. He's merely pointing out that the gift of eternal faith impacts our earthly existence. And he says... Real faith produces good works. What's this? Let's read verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. I would not want to have James on a church board. <laughs> He'd be the one always calling you in to check. Why are you thinking that, Pastor? Lord, tell you, is it your idea? I mean, he's all over you. It is useless and it is dead. You never had to. I don't know if he was successfully married or not. I bet you he didn't say that at home. I'm just going to tell you. Okay. Here's what he's saying. A declared faith has to be a demonstrated faith. Now, James uses the same word as did Paul, which means divine persuasion for faith. Now. One that moves us to complete reliance upon God. But he says that that gift is displayed through good deeds. Now, I want to show you even how the original language makes the message perfect that he's trying to get across. Let's look at the word works. It is the word ergon, which is a deed that carries out, listen now, an inner desire, intention, or purpose. It's not a surface work he's talking about where you just think, hey, I'm going to do something good for somebody today. It is a work that something is welling up on the inside of you that is pushing that work out. Are you following me? So it is not a good deed of man that's religion. It is a real relationship-based act. Wow. A gift of faith on the inside of you, seeking expression on the outside of you, that is faith producing good works. See, he is, he is, by no means is James putting down the gift of salvation that comes by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He's just asking to see it. Paul argues the experience of salvation. James argues the evidence of salvation. Paul speaks of justification before God, but, Paul, but James is speaking of validation before men. He's saying, how can you show me your faith? They're not in conflict. One is justification before God, the other is validation before men. How can you show me your faith without your good works? Paul argues the position of salvation in Christ, and James argues the proof of salvation before men. You're going to see why that's important in just a moment. And as usual, the influence of his big brother Jesus comes through in his teaching. It's like James didn't have an original thought. He just thought a lot about what his brother said. And he began to share that very practically with us. Jesus talked about in Matthew being salt and light. 
And he goes on to say that nobody takes that lamp and puts it under a bowl, but they put it on a candlestick or or, or some sort of pedestal so that it will give light to the whole household. And then he says this, in the same way, let your light shine. Don't hide it under the bowl of apathy. Don't hide it under the bowl of inactivity. Put your light on a stand to give light to the whole house. Watch this. Let it shine before others that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's break this verse down a moment. The word light is the Greek word phos, which means a source of light. And that's used throughout the New Testament to describe a manifestation of God's self-existent life. Divine illumination to reveal and impart life through Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at the, the good works Jesus talks about. The word good is kaios, which means good that inspires others to embrace what is lovely, what is beautiful, what is praiseworthy. Let's go on to the next word. And the word works, ergon again, a deed that carries out an inner desire, intention, or purpose. Let's put together what Jesus is saying. Let the life of God in you produce a life that inspires others by good deeds that reveal your internal and eternal motivation, not so that people will look at you, but so people will look to God. (laughs) He didn't save you to sit you down. He didn't save you to hide you under a bowl. He saved you to put you on a stand so that people will see the life of God in you manifest through your good works and realize there must be something different about you than there is about them. They need to look for the same source. Wow. James is not saying good works save us. That's self-righteousness and that's as filthy rags before God. It's like letting the husband do the laundry. (laughs) it comes back looking like it did before it went in does it because they don't know everything that you do just well okay or at least in my house it's like me doing the laundry now here's what he's saying we don't do what we do to be saved we do what we do because we're saved since we have been redeemed we are choosing to live redemptively We are choosing to let our actions be redeemed and to do good works that manifest faith. So for Christians, it's not faith versus works, it's faith that works. Okay? You ready to read on? Verses 19 and 20. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. If he had written this in Tennessee, he would have said, bless your heart. It's not a blessing. My, my, we, we had a family yard sale. I can't believe I'm even talking about them in front of people. How embarrassing. We had a family yard sale this weekend for fun, getting rid of cleaning stuff out. And dad goes over and sees a sign that he probably already owns and he buys it. <laughs> and the sign said, bless your heart. And my dad is so holy, he thinks everything's good. I'm like, you know, that's not a blessing, right? <laughs> people say, bless your heart. They're saying, you are one brick shy of a load. Just one French fry short of a Happy Meal, right? (laughs) That's what he's saying. This is kind of what James is saying. Bless your heart. Watch this. That means you're as good as the devil if you believe that God exists. I wonder if Satan has better revelation of God than we do because it says the devils know and they tremble. They know he's holy. They know he's righteous. They know he's almighty. And because they have positioned themselves against him, they tremble at the thought of him. That's powerful, folks. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? What do you really think, Brother James? Mental assent is not enough. Even the devils know there's a God. We are talking about divine persuasion that becomes our motivation for life. Faith is the energy that fuels good deeds. But what kind of deeds are we talking about? Well, I can tell you it's much deeper than the uh, Boy Scout helping the little old lady across the road. Now, that's a good deed, provided the little old lady wants to cross the road. (laughs) 
But if you help her over there and her house is on this side of the road and she can't get back, that's a problem. James is going much deeper than what you learn in Boy Scouts when he's talking about good deeds. And he exposes to us three categories that faith of good deeds that faith will produce in our life. Let's read on. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, Goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, and eat well. Praying for you. (laughs) But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do, he says? Wow. In verse 17, like we read earlier, he says, it's useless. It doesn't produce anything. It doesn't do any good. See, real faith produces compassion. Genuine compassion. For a person of genuine faith, empathy is not enough. Our faith doesn't merely move us to feel sorry for the condition of the other people. It moves us to acts of compassion toward other people. Okay? To say you're in my thoughts and prayers is showing empathy. And if you really pray for them, that's good. At least you're not lying to them. But how many people you said praying for your brother and you didn't call their name? But you said it in that moment because you felt some sympathy. You had empathy for that person. Understand, that's not what real faith produces. Real faith goes beyond how we feel about something and moves us to act to change it. For instance, if you say, be warm, eat well, and give them nothing, you've not done any good. When a person's genuinely in need, you can't speak the blessing over them. You have to be willing to become the blessing to them. It calls you to action. God didn't just feel sorry. He didn't have empathy for man or sympathy for man in our sins. His love motivated him to do something about it. And he gave the most sacrificial gift of his only son, Jesus Christ, to improve our condition. (laughs) That's what the motivation of faith leads you to. You know, one of the things we're learning as a team, and it's really hard, is that when people are going through tough times and you say, I'm praying for you, that's good. But then we ask them a question, is there anything we can do for you? And we truly want to know as a team. And 99.9% of the, 99.99% of the time, they will say, just pray. But do you know how much a homemade banana pudding would mean to that person? Now I'm using a southern delicacy and trying to plant a subliminal message for those of you that want to bring me a homemade banana pudding. But do you realize how much just taking the time to bake something and take it to them would mean? Rather than saying, is there anything we can do, why not just do it? Because they're going to tell you, no, just pray. But the truth is, they need somebody's arms around them. Come on, somebody. They need somebody to show them some practical love, even if it's got some calories in it. Come on now. They need somebody to do something. That's what real faith produces, acts of compassion. Now, he's again, it's like James didn't have an original thought. He's he's continuing to spout out what he learned from his brother Jesus. As Jesus is approached in Luke chapter 10 by a Pharisee questioning him on eternal life. And this teacher of the law says to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you teach it. What do you think? I love the way he turned the tides on people. And he said, well, then I need to love the Lord the God, my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. And Jesus says, winner, winner, chicken dinner. You got it right. You got it right. But now, trying to justify himself and his exclusive mindset of religion, he said, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus picks out the person that that man had the greatest disdain for. And he teaches us the parable we call the Good Samaritan. Samaritans were hated by Jews, and it was just like Jesus to make the hated the hero. (laughs) He still does that, by the way. He takes people you don't have any use for and he uses them greatly. 
And that's what he was trying to show them. That the law said that this man was to stop and take compassion on a man. That, and when it's Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, he tells a story of a man who's walking along the road, gets robbed and beaten and left for dead. And here comes the religious person, the Pharisee, and he sees the person in the ditch and he crosses over to the other side of the road and keeps going. So Jesus is saying, hey, it's not what's written on the book of your law. It's what's written in your heart that matters. And he takes this this, um, good Samaritan, this person that the Jews hated so bad that they would literally take a longer route around the the city of Samaria so so they wouldn't have to deal with those people. And Jesus says, but this Samaritan who doesn't live by this law stopped and did something he picks the man up, I'll make the story short, takes him to a, to a hotel or a place of lodging, gets him the, the medicine and the stuff he needs, and he tells the, the, the hotel owner, he says, hey, if this man runs up any kind of tab, just put it on my tab and I'll pay it when I come back through. This is complete compassion on this person's part, and it was given to a stranger. See, we're not just called to have compassion on the people we know, we're called to have compassion on the people we don't know. Even when we say, oh, they're going to buy booze with it. They're probably just going to get high from it. <laughs> like everything we do with our money is holy, right? <laughs> they probably, you know what? Sometimes faith produces compassion when you don't know the outcome. Leave the outcome up to God. You do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Real faith will produce compassion. And it's not just for the ministry. It's for the laity. Okay, I'll say it in Tennessee terms. It's not just for the pulpit. It's for the pews. Real faith produces compassion in everybody that has it. And he goes on to illustrate that point because he's going to tell two more stories that tell you that compassion and real acts of faith and real faith moves people to action whether they are the affluent or the people that are overlooked, whether they have plea or whether they have nothing. And he literally talks about a patriarch and a prostitute that had real faith. And in both cases, no matter who they were, real faith produced good works in their life. Let's look at the patriarch. Now, he's talking to Jewish people so he can say this. And, and, and I don't like it when preachers say this because preachers will get up and say, you know the story. <laughs> you could, you, when, when I was a kid, that was a safe bet. Because you heard the story at home, you heard it at church, you may have heard it on TV. But, but now a lot of people that we have out there, they don't know the story. But he's talking to people that are acquainted with the story. And he says this, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see his faith and his actions work together. Wow. Here's what he's telling them. Faith not only produces compassion, real faith Watch this. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Real faith has, watch this. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Real faith produces obedience. It's going to get real quiet. I'm not talking about I go to church and pay my tithe kind of, kind of faith, although that's where it starts, by the way. A lot of you are at the I go to church phase. I wish more of you would get to I pay my tithe phase obedience. That would be great. Not for me because it doesn't impact me. It just impacts our ability to, to work the gospel on the earth. That's all it's given to you. But now watch this. It's not just I go to church, I pay my tithe, I'm obedient at that level. He's talking about a radical obedience that will lay everything on the line to say yes to God. Wow. I've got to quickly tell this story. But he uses the patriarch Abraham. The word, when, when God met Abraham, his name was not Abraham, it was Abram, which means exalted father. And God says, I'm the exalted father, so you have to change your name. <laughs> Ain't but one chief in this town, and that's me, God says. So I'm going to call you Abraham, father of many. Now, Abraham was an older man, and so was his, his wife was older as well. So this 
promise contained in his name, Father of Many, was going to take faith and works. You'll get that when you go home and you go, oh, that's what he meant. He couldn't just, when couples come up to me and say, Pastor, we want you to pray with us. We're believing God for a baby. I go, are you doing anything about it? Are you sitting on opposite ends of the couch on your iPads praying for babies? No. There is a natural process that works with faith that causes babies to be born. If you don't know what it is, don't Google it. <laughs> Look it up in an encyclopedia, paper where it's safe, okay? But understand, God gave him a promise that not only required him to be persuaded, but it, it required him to be obedient. 25 years pass from the time he receives the promise that Isaac would be born. Isaac is finally born. They're now getting pretty old. They should be in a home. They're so old. I mean, they're older than people who would move to retirement homes. My dad says, back off, son. Now, think about it. They are, they are I mean, they're getting to triple digit territory. Okay? They have this son. By the time God looks to Abraham and says, I want you to take your only son, Isaac, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham was ready to do exactly what God said. See, as they approach the mountain, they begin to build the altar to sacrifice. This Isaac was now a young man, if not a teenager. He's a, in, in his young 20s to early 30s. And they're building the altar. And he looks to his dad and says, Who's the sacrifice? I don't have time to explain the dynamics when he finds out it's me. Okay? Abraham looks at his son and says, God will provide a ram. Abraham's willing to go through with God to the very moment where he raises the knife over his son and is ready to take his life. And the angel of the Lord holds his hand. And Abraham looks over and sees the day of Jesus. As he sees a ram that's caught in the thicket. For that, for us, that was the foreshadowing of Jesus coming to be the sacrifice for our sins. God was showing Abraham, you give your son because I'm going to give my son. And I want the world to see through this that my son's on the way. But for Abraham, it was a test of his faith. Would he be obedient with the blessing? See, he gets to that point And that's when he reaches up and he's ready to sacrifice. And God calls him, Abraham, Abraham. What does Abraham mean? Father of many. Father of many, father of many. When you get to the place of obedience in your life, that's when God doubles down on the blessing. Amen. Father of many. Father of many. And then watch this. The Bible says, God says, I swear by myself. The Bible tells us not to swear at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by earth, because it's his footstool. Why does it tell us not to swear? I'm not talking about saying curse words. I'm talking about making oaths. Here's the reason. God is the only one with the ability to absolutely keep that oath. He has all authority and all power to do it. Watch this. So he says, I, and the Bible says God swear by himself. Why? Because he can swear by no greater. He, declare, he says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, the one who has the power to keep this promise, that because this is done, you have done this, and you've not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands of the seashore. I say again, when we get to the point of living obedient, that's when God doubles down on the promise. Faith didn't lead him to blessing. We've got to correct that theology. We teach that kind of mess, and people give their life to Jesus and expect everything to go well from that moment on. Faith doesn't lead to blessing. Faith leads to obedience, and obedience leads to blessing. Man, I, somebody called Jared. He might want to preach this morning. Here's what I'm telling you. We got to correct our thinking. God doesn't call us 
to be blessed, he calls us to become a blessing, and in the process, he blesses us. You can't bring a blessing through someone that you're not willing to bring to someone. And God will not send blessing to people. He can't get through people. Are you following me today? Blessing doesn't come as an act of faith. It comes of being so divinely persuaded that God is directing your steps that you say yes to God and you walk in obedience before God. And then God says, Father of many, Father of many. I hope we're catching this. I'm trying my best to throw it right over the strike zone this morning. See, you may have the promise of plenty in your life. You may have the promise of greatness. You may have the promise of big ministry in your life. There may be words that God's given through other people over your life, prophetic words that you've not seen. But let me ask you something. Have you taken the blessing and become obedient with it? Because people that live at a greater level of blessing have to learn that while they're at the meager stage of blessing, they got to be obedient with the blessing if God's ever going to increase the blessing. So if you've got a promise over your life, if God has great purpose over your life, visit the mountain of sacrifice. You look to God and say yes to God in every area of your life and then watch God open up everything he said. And when you've got one son, God's called you the father of many. He's going to bring about the many. Wow, that's the patriarch. But then there's the prostitute. Let's finish with her. Are you ready? I swear by myself, declares the Lord. I read it over there. I didn't even go through the screen. You can see old habits die hard. Let's go to Rahab. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those, those messengers and sent them safely away on a different road. Now, that takes a lot of explanation. I'm going to try to do it quickly. This is an Old Testament story where the people of Israel were in the wilderness. They had previously sent 12 spies to the city that was walled and, and strong and had an army. They sent those spies in to say, hey, will God really keep his promise? <laughs> do you really have to send spies out to check on God? Well, 10 of those spies came back saying, no way, Jose, they are giants. We are grasshoppers. They will squash us like a bug. Two of those people came back saying, we are well able. Let's do this tomorrow. One was Caleb. The other was Joshua. So when it came time to send spies back in, he learned his lesson. He didn't send the casual believers. He sent two people of faith. And all I know is that Rahab, a harlot in the city, who had no connection with the faith in Jehovah, must have been so influenced by these two spies that she was moved to help them. Here's what it tells us. Real faith will lead to acts of compassion, acts of obedience, and real faith produces service. She had... No connection with the cause until somebody enthused about the cause came across her path. Let me say to our young people, that's a good lesson about the kind of people you hang out with. If you want to have real faith, hang out with people that have real faith. It will influence you. It did this prostitute. And you know what? She simply served a cause greater than herself. You know what impresses me more than anything? And, and, and I want to anonymously share this, but the Lord brought it and dropped it in my spirit. I was in the presence of a really, well, a whole bunch of great people recently. And there was a man whom I have a lot of respect for his accomplishments in life. And he told a story about driving a church bus and picking up kids and teaching them. Some of you were there that night. You heard that story. I was moved. But more than anything I've ever seen him accomplish, I was moved by the fact he served a cause greater than himself. That's what Rahab did. And you know what? Because she did, her family was spared. Yes. And because she did, <laughs> she is in the lineage of Jesus himself, a prostitute of a foreign people. 
that should not even be mentioned in the lineage of Jesus according to our eyes. But she said, I believe something that will move me to serve a cause that is not about me, that is greater than myself. And because of it, she goes down in the annals of history as a hero of faith. And she's mentioned by James in his epistle as he's telling you, be like that prostitute. You may not have anything. You may be overlooked. But if you'll just believe, if you will be I'm so divinely convinced, persuaded by God, that you will do something that is greater than you. Real faith produces compassion, obedience, and service. That's what real faith looks like. That's how people see what you believe. That's what causes others to believe. So let me leave you with these probing questions. Number one, I better get him up here. James says, the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. How many of you, does, guys, does your wife have to slap you and say, breathe, honey? Anybody? Except when you're sleeping, right? You got a thick leg like, like me, wife says, breathe, honey, okay? Nobody has to tell you to breathe. It's an expression of life. When somebody quits breathing, they quit living. That means as long as I have faith, compassion, obedience, and service will mark my life. Here's some questions you can live with this week. Does my empathy move me to action? Do I simply just feel sorry for people in my heart? Or do I do something about it when I see it? Number two. Is there any area of disobedience in my life? And we're going to pray over that when Pastor Travis is getting ready to come. Is there any place where I'm not putting it all on the altar with God? And I believe some people need to put some things on that altar today and say yes to God. What causes do I serve that's greater than me? What am I involved in that's not about me? I love the, the organization I Am Second. Boy, they get that right. They get that right. There's only one number one. There's only one number one. And when you put others before yourself, that's real faith. Am I a person of intention or a person of action? Do you intend to be compassionate, obedient, and to serve? Or do you actually do it? The time for casual Christianity is gone. The time to sign up and say, Lord, I'm here. I'm going to be compassionate on the needs of others. I'm going to be obedient even when everybody around me says you're crazy as a loon. I'm going to say yes to you, God. You know what? People who are radically obedient become radically blessed. Can I get a witness from somebody? People who are radically obedient become radically blessed. But here's the thing. God does not save us and deposit faith in us just to be blessed. He does it so that we become the blessing the world needs to turn their hearts to him and accept his son, Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. It's not about them looking at me or looking at you. It's about letting faith express itself in our deeds that turn people's attention to the Father in heaven who is there waiting to love them, to bless them, to save them, to deliver them, to heal them. How many of you believe we're serving a God that saves, delivers, and heals? If you want the world to know it, let your faith speak through your life in Jesus' name. Faith that works. It is our faith that moves us to be compassionate, obedient, and to serve. And I pray that today God makes us aware of opportunities to continue to walk out our good deeds as we point others to the Father. GC family, we are excited that we are leaning to the work of our journey as we explore James and put our faith in action because you and I, all of us, we are called to light up the world for Jesus Christ. And if you are new here today, we want to invite you to join 
on our online campus. Simply text the word online to 615-488-7151 or you can visit gcchurch.tv. And while you're there, maybe you're curious about your next step. We want to invite you to sign up for Starting Point, a great way to learn more about GC Church, our mission, our core values, and how we want to partner with you to walk out your God purpose. So be sure to register today and we look forward to seeing all that God has for you. It's an exciting week ahead. Go out, put your faith in action, and remember one last thing, God loves you and so does GC Church.